Of all natural disasters, floods are the most common and the most deadly. When their bodies were found, many of them didn't even have body hair or clothing left. They have the power to bury cities, decimate farmlands, and ruin economies. These extreme rainfall events are known to produce some of the highest impact uh, types of weather phenomena that we see around the world. Floods are inevitable, but their catastrophic effects depend largely on human behavior. When you have very urbanized environments, that actually can contribute more to the flood. We see these events all over the world where the weather event plus the vulnerability can truly lead to a major disaster. Look, my entire life forward is washed away. How we build, where we live, how we power our lives. These floods had a one in a thousand year chance of, uh, of occurring. But with climate change, it increases the odds. And this much bigger flood wave then comes and hits a much denser population. What can we learn from the big floods of our time? And how can we best prepare for an uncertain future? Around the world, humanity exists only moments from catastrophe. Disaster bubbles below the surface of the Earth, strikes from the heavens, or engulfs us from the sea. But we are not merely at the mercy of our planet. In our pursuit of industry, global connectivity, and reach for the stars, lives have been lost. Disasters reveal the best and worst of mankind, as one tragedy compounds another. How do these disasters occur? And what lessons can equip us when catastrophe strikes again? Pakistan is a landscape of extremes. It sits on the edge of the world's warmest ocean the Indian Ocean, and backs up against the icy peaks of the Himalayas. It has this mountainous region that is very steep, but then after that, it's, it's relatively flat. It has this mountainous region, very fertile lands. From the glaciers to the sea runs the mighty Indus. The Indus River is one of the biggest rivers in the world. It has a massive floodplain, and this is essentially the reason why that part of the world is so fertile and so productive in terms of agriculture. The Indus Valley is one of the early cradles of civilization. Around 6,000 years ago, people here began farming the landscape and building urban centers. Now, more than 100 million people in Pakistan rely on the river for drinking water and irrigation. The Indus gets some of its waters from snow and glacial melt, but most from the enormous amount of water dumped each year by the Asian monsoon. Its people are no stranger to flooding. In fact, it's key to their survival. Flood is essentially the inundation of water on a land that normally is not covered by water. This inundation can be massive. It can be really inundated for kilometers and kilometers and kilometers. It can be a minor inundation. These Minor inundations are the frequent floods that civilization has depended on to sustain our ecosystems or provide nutrients or spread silt on floodplains. This is where the biggest, you know, agricultural farms in the world have existed. The Asian monsoon can vary dramatically in its intensity 
as it's driven by heat. Every summer, the monsoon starts about uh, June, and it runs through August or September every year, and it brings most of the rainfall to the region. It's primarily forced by a difference in the land and sea temperature. In the summer, the land heats up much faster than the ocean, and this drives a lot of the oceanic moisture into the continent that is then focused by the Himalayas. And it creates copious amounts of rainfall throughout the country. And this is the majority of the water that falls on the continent. Every three years on average, Pakistan experiences a major flood. But 2010 was their most destructive in history. The monsoon is a life-giving, you know, source of water for a lot of South Asia. But that one was extraordinary in that there was an exceptionally long duration of heavy rain. There's also been a tendency in recent decades for the monsoon front to be a little bit further north, which is causing rain to occur in parts of the country that have more steep terrain. Heavy monsoonal rain had already been falling through most of July, with floods creating havoc in Balochistan. But in the last week, a torrential downpour began to pound the northwest province of Khyber Pathankhwa, a mountainous part of the country that normally remains arid and dry, even in monsoon season. It was basically very weak uh, precipitation that was formed by the uplift of moist air along the topography, which is very rare, actually, for this part of the world. Some parts of the province reported almost four meters of rain in a week. The steep terrain concentrated the intense rain into pockets of the landscape, creating flash floods. Basically, you get more rainfall into the, some of these river valleys that then collects and then floods the lowlands. And in this Pakistan case, actually, it, it flooded Peshawar, which is a river valley uh, kind of in, in the lowlands, but the precipitation was concentrated over the complex terrain. Think of a flood as a spectrum. On the very short fused end of the spectrum, it rains, and even before the rain stops, within hours, you can have a very devastating flood moving through. That's a flash flood. In Pakistan, you had, in the initial stages with these big bursts of rain, you had flash flooding, especially in the steep areas where the water's gonna flow faster. But then eventually that reached the big rivers, which swelled up and it took days, you know, for them to reach their peak as well. So they saw the whole spectrum. Some tributaries of the Indus almost doubled their previous record flow rates. Many rivers reach record levels. But even the smaller creeks, as you go up into the highlands, in some cases, they were the first to burst their banks, cause flash floods. And that ended up downstream in the bigger rivers. Locals described the rivers as demons, consuming all in their path. <laughs> Although floodwaters subsided within days in the northern parts of Pakistan, more than a thousand were killed in these early flash floods. Floodwaters are, are one of the world's worst natural hazards in terms of loss of life and economic damage, and people quite often underestimate the power of water. As soon as water starts to move, it can be highly destructive. Each cubic metre weighs a tonne. It can rip up 
boulders weighing tons, if it hits a building or a car or a person, then it just has an enormous force behind it. For many Venezuelans, the power of water is something they will never forget. In 1999, a devastating debris flow hit the state of Vargas, a narrow strip of coastline to the north of the country. The December 1999 floods in the north coast of Venezuela were exceptional because it was one of the deadliest recorded floods in history. In fact, I'm told in Vargas State, 10% of the population lost their lives. In that event, tens of thousands were buried alive under torrents of mud and rocks, even as they slept. Y resulta que hemos encontrado una gran cantidad de personas que están en estado crítico. Y lo peor que tiene es que hay una gran cantidad de cadáveres que están en proceso de, de descomposición. There's a dreadful irony to the Vargas tragedy. Its history of catastrophic flooding is the reason so many people settled here in the first place. If you're not familiar with the north coast of Venezuela, it's very steep mountains that come down to the Caribbean Sea. Historically, there have been many flash floods there that deposit a lot of sediment and debris, and they create these flat, fan-shaped areas called alluvial fans. Alluvial fans are typically found where a canyon drains out from the base of mountains. They form when heavy rains lift the topsoil and rocks off steep slopes and carry them towards the ocean. These fans can be enormous. Entire cities have been built on alluvial fans. Because these are flat, these are natural places for cities to build. So the population tends to be located on these alluvial fans but these alluvial fans are still building. One of these is the Carabaeda fan. The city of Carabaeda was founded several years after the last major flood event in 1951. By 1999, the population had swelled to more than 300,000. In Vargas State, and in particular in the city of Carabaleta, we combine two things that we see so often in floods. There's the intense rain, and then there was the vulnerability. You had a major flood event, something that there's evidence has happened before, and you have now, what you didn't have centuries ago, a large population on the areas where the debris is being deposited. December is not normally rainy in Venezuela. The wet season usually wraps up around October, but a cold front had interacted with a moist southwesterly wind in the Pacific Ocean, and heavy rains began to fall in the San Julian Basin, which feeds the Carabaeda fan. There was a period of abnormally high rainfall so that the ground is wet, Rivers are already running high. And then on the night of December 15th into 16th was the really intense rain. Eyewitness accounts say debris flows began around 8 p.m. on the 15th, when a phenomenal amount of water cascaded down the mountainside, ripping apart the landscape and triggering thousands of shallow landslides. There's a huge amount of water moving down a very steep slope. Once water's picked up a lot of debris and it's got boulders in it, then, then all sorts of structures will be vulnerable. And all of this started coming down and finally it hit this flat patch of land. That is where all the people were living and it caused massive devastation. The amount of water that came down the steep slopes in three days was almost double the yearly average rainfall. The United States Geological Society estimates around 1.8 million cubic meters were dumped on the city. The city was destroyed boulders the size of trucks 
were lifted off the mountainside and hurled into apartment buildings. Bueno, esto fue algo inesperado, pero esta vez fue algo, como se dice, como si se hubiera abierto el Cerro Ávila. Debris deposits were head high. No exact death toll was recorded because entire towns, including Cerro Grande, simply vanished. Only a thousand bodies were recovered, but it's thought up to 30,000 people may have perished, either buried or swept out to sea. Survival of those kinds of floods where you have a lot of debris in the water and it's high velocity water is very difficult. There was a study done in, in the United States in the state of Colorado where 144 people died in a flash flood in 1976 and the coroner had determined that none of them drowned. They all died from traumatic injuries. Many of them didn't even have body hair or clothing left when their bodies were found. That's the force of what happens in these steep mountain areas when you have all this debris coming down with the water. This is an example of ferocity of a flash flood. A flood that is coming down a big river, a long river like the Indus or the Ganges or any of the long rivers, uh, it's kind of predictable. With such steep mountains, the prediction time is nothing. In the aftermath, 64,000 troops were deployed to Vargas, along with massive bulldozers to clear an access path to the towns. The major highways were buried, making evacuations difficult. For those survivors who stayed, there were little supplies for months. A notoriously volatile part of the world, looting was widespread amidst reports of rapes and other violence. Vigilantes patrolled the streets with sticks and baseball bats. The cost was put at close to 3.5 billion US dollars. But despite the inherent risks of living on the Carabaeda fan, the city began to rebuild once more. Ahorita está todo destruido por todos lados y mientras que uno consigue esto será dentro de un año, dos años que arreglen esto, que uno se puede ir mientras tanto hay que seguir durmiendo aquí porque para dónde se va a ir uno? ¿Para dónde? While severe floods have occurred on these alluvial fans since prehistoric times, the Vargas death toll may have been much lower had the steep terrain above not been deforested. The rain that comes down, about 10% of that will get stuck onto the leaves of the tree. That's called interception. So basically you're having roughly 10% more rain coming down instantly onto the ground. Forests help stabilize an area. So when you remove forests, the, the soil is much more prone when it's on a steep slope to just slide away with the flood. So this whole process of the rain flowing to the river becomes much faster. Deforestation has also stripped Pakistan bare in recent decades. When it became independent in 1947, around a third of the country was covered in forest. Now, that figure is less than 2%. Some of the tree loss is due to poverty, with trees providing fuel and other resources. But most is attributed to the Timber Mafia, an illegal and ruthless logging organization which has operated under the protection of the Taliban. In the flash floods, logs from felled trees caused devastation of their own. Swept out of the valleys into raging rivers 
They helped smash down every bridge in their path. एक पुल भी नहीं बचा मालाकांड से लेके कलाम तक तो पहली हमारी कोशिश ये है कि लोग जो है कम से कम पैदल पार कर सके तो ये More than 250 bridges collapsed in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa alone. So you have damages and transportation routes not at just one bridge but across the entire segment of the river. Flash floods took out power stations, telecommunication towers, homes, crops and other infrastructure, creating a rolling disaster. The rolling disaster is essentially a disaster happening that is triggering off another disaster that is triggering off another disaster. Ite ma raste de la dan pira. Na dar karna tai bas Allah sanai kai gari ban saba. Wo da jaao ba. Allah sanai kai gari ban saba bas sanai kai. We have a major flood event. The services that sustain society, they are the first things to get disrupted. Transportation routes are impacted. people are unable often to communicate all the storm water services all the sanitation services are not working so it's it's like one problem after another by early august flood waters had begun to subside in the north and create devastation in the south punjab and sind were inundated as the indus broke its banks in many places the rains simply wouldn't stop deforestation helped silt up many waterways and dams reducing their flow capacity ironically so did levees canals and other structures built to tame the river the entire indus valley area is probably one of the most efficient um irrigation networks in the world but when you create canals you don't really allow for the frequent floods to occur these minor floods should take the silt from the river and wash it out onto the flood plains but as more canals and irrigation systems crisscross the landscape less silt is escaping the river system so the amount of space you have between the bottom of the canal or the river and the land starts reducing so the river levels start rising up over course of time now when you have this big major flood coming along this major flood impacts much more than what it would have had the river bottom been a little bit lower from degradation of the environment to failed engineering projects A raft of human activities enhanced the 2010 floods. But of them all, the long-term burning of fossil fuels attracted the biggest portion of the blame. The intensity, northerly position, and persistence of the rainfall were all linked to anthropogenic climate change. 2010 was quite remarkable. in many places around the world the sea surface temperatures were very unusual throughout the tropics the overheated atlantic waters triggered a vigorous hurricane season and this helped set up a strange circulation pattern in the atmosphere the northern hemisphere jet stream began to wander There are several components to the jet stream. The one we hear about the most, the polar jet, is a ribbon of air that flows west to east, and there are waves in the jet stream. Then along those waves, that's where storm systems occur. The westerly winds push these systems across the globe. Sometimes those waves can get really amplified, so they're very north-south. When that happens, the bottom of the wave what we call the trough can become very slow moving so when you have a very amplified flow you could get a storm stuck in one area and you could get a dry spell in what we call the ridges stuck in another area and that's exactly what happened in 2010 this buckling of the jet stream 
carried the monsoon rains further north into Pakistan than normal. At the same time, Russia sweltered under a massive, stagnant, high-pressure system. They lasted for about a couple of months, enough to really cause major trouble in Russia, where it got extraordinarily hot and dry, wildfires broke out, uh, things got uh, quite out of control, in fact. And then, not that far away, in fact, there were substantial floods over Pakistan. We found anomalous circulation patterns that brought warm, moist air from both the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal all the way up into the, into the region near uh, northwest India and Pakistan that then rose up the terrain and it eventually caused the floods that occurred throughout the month. Although the majority of deaths in Pakistan were due to the flash flooding, it was the persistence of the rain that displaced so many people. The Pakistan 2010 flood actually was more of a slow rise flood. What happens in many of the big flood and drought events that we see around the world. But again, there's some studies showing there's a somewhat greater tendency for that to occur in recent decades. There is evidence that over the last 60 years, the jet stream is the waviest it's been for centuries, favoring more of these systems that become stuck. A leading theory is that a warming Arctic is a major contributor. So one of the things that helps drive the jet stream is the Arctic and the Antarctic are these real cold reservoirs. And what causes the jet stream is the thermal difference between the north and the south. The temperature difference between these icy regions and the tropics drives the winds that form the jet streams. The Arctic is warming faster than anywhere on Earth. And in summer, much of the Arctic is now ice-free. It's lowering the temperature difference between the tropics and the poles. So rather than this real strong west-east jet stream pattern in the northern hemisphere, the fact that the Arctic isn't as dramatically cold as it used to be is allowing more of that wavy pattern. That's as the theory goes. There's still a lot of discussion and debate about it, but there's more and more scientists studying that idea. Like a lazy river, the jet stream is wandering all over the place. And this favors all sorts of unusual and persistent weather systems. From severe drought, to unseasonal blizzards, to torrential rains that just won't go away. But there's another way global warming intensifies floods. Louisiana, on the southeast of the US, sits at the edge of the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. This is a state used to a good drenching. Southern Louisiana is a place that gets heavy rain. There's no doubt about it. But the rains that fell in 2016 were off the charts dumping as much as seven centimeters per hour in some parts. Baton Rouge bore the brunt of it. My entire life for it just washed away. Hurts you to your heart to see him, you know, that happened to him, but that's what happened. It was a weak tropical depression that didn't have a strong circulation attached to it, but it had tremendous amounts of rainfall. There were some measurements along the coast, along the Gulf Coast, and they recorded the largest amount of moisture in the atmosphere that had ever been recorded in that area. And this is associated with quite warm conditions in the Gulf, and the moisture was coming out of the Gulf and just dumped a tremendous amount of water on the, on the ground in that region. At the same time, in the center of the US, a short wave trough was forming. This is an atmospheric disturbance that causes air to rise ahead of it. The trough drifted towards the Gulf of Mexico. Eventually, the two systems met and produced a double lift effect. 
the warm, moist air rose rapidly, then cooled before the rains came down. This is kind of what you associate with a very violent or vigorous thunderstorm uh, that you see with strong updrafts, uh, very high precipitation rates. Sometimes you have hail. Nearly 26 trillion liters of water were dumped on Louisiana in a week, three times more than during Hurricane Katrina. It was unprecedented in anyone's living memory. We actually lost everything in Katrina, came here, and 10 years later lost everything again. So I think when they started getting these tremendous amounts of rains day after day after day, the disaster was already unfolding around them before people and officials started realizing, wow, this is actually a lot worse than it first appeared it might be. But it wasn't just a once in a lifetime flood. In terms of the past records, they were regarded at the time as one in a thousand year floods in some locations. But with climate change, these are not unexpected, but to many people, they are. The Amite River rose almost 1.5 meters above its previous record level. Here in the United States, many cities designed their systems with 50 or 100 years of flood record. That's not enough to tell us what the big ones are. And when you have very urbanized environments, that actually can contribute more to the flood as well, because pavement and development tend to inhibit the ability of water to soak into the ground. So cities are known to actually flood with less rain than rural areas. In the Louisiana floods, 13 people lost their lives. Most of them in cars. So in societies where cars are, are more prevalent, people are used to driving their cars and they, they feel quite safe in their cars. But really a car is just like a, a bubble of air, like a balloon. Ironically, most car deaths happen in the larger, heavier vehicles, as drivers presume them to be safe. So we ran a series of tests on a range of different cars. So a large four-wheel drive in 60 or 70 centimetres of water, the, the rear wheels will start floating. We were quite amazed at how little water it did take for, for those vehicles to become unstable. Once the water rises above the floor of the car, it will interact with a bubble of air in the cabin. For compact cars, this is not even knee height. Smaller cars will start floating in very shallow water depths of the order of 30 or 40 centimetres. Once you're floating, you go where the water goes and usually it's water going over a road embankment or over the top of a bridge that lifts the car off and then pushes it off the embankment or off the bridge into deeper water. Roadways are completely flooded. You can't see any of the signage, uh, basically feeling your way through high water. In Louisiana, emergency services were overwhelmed with the volume of people needing rescue. So, the Cajun Navy stepped in. So the Cajun Navy is this group, predominantly of boat owners, who are from the U.S. Gulf Coast, who, after a number of major disasters, they have actually come together, they've taken their boats, they've mobilized, and they've gone out, and they've actually rescued people during these flooding disasters. We had a boat, so we're trying to do whatever we can in our time of crisis and disasters. The Cajun Navy formed during Hurricane Katrina and reactivated in the Louisiana floods and Hurricane Harvey, rescuing thousands of people. 
they actually used social media and they used other data sources to identify where stranded populations are located and so forth. And so the Cajun Navy really seems to be all about people coming together to help people. Before floodwaters had even subsided, media reports began to ask whether there was a link between the extreme flooding and climate change. To address the question, a rapid attribution study was launched using the best available observational data and climate simulations. They found that rising temperatures had almost doubled the likelihood of a disaster like the Louisiana floods. Most of the heat is ending up in the oceans, and this has consequences. It means the air above the oceans is warmer and the air is moister, and this then affects all storms. It affects storms because heat energy allows water molecules to break free of the surface tension and become water vapor or evaporate. The warmer it gets, the more water vapor can be transported. Let's say you're not putting any more water down on the surface, but you're just redistributing how it occurs. There could be areas that have long dry spells. And then where it does rain, because the oceans are warmer, they're pumping a little bit more moisture into the atmosphere, it can rain much more intensely than it had before. The scientific community has established that there is typically a 7% increase in the extreme rainfall that can occur with each degree rise in warming. This has resulted in extreme rainfalls across the world increasing. Coupled to this, the fact that we have more people in the world, these population essentially are congregating more and more towards the cities. The cities lie near the rivers where the water lies. You have more people, more infrastructure assets being exposed to any flood damage, and these floods are more intense because you're having this much more rainfall coming down. Heated waters also provide the driving force for cyclones, which can help create severe flooding events, especially when they come in the middle of a wet season. Mozambique is an African nation on the southeast coast. It's a downstream country. Nine of Southeast Africa's major rivers, including the Zambezi, cross through Mozambique on their way to the ocean. It's one of the poorest countries in the world, and with a lack of irrigation infrastructure, most people live right on the waterways. Most settlements, wherever you are in the world, are nearby rivers and streams. A lot of farming also occurs on floodplains because of the soil that comes down the catchment and these floods is very rich and, and fertile for growing crops. So a lot of settlements are on river floodplains because of that reason as well. Whatever happens upstream, Mozambique suffers the consequences. Mozambique in the late fall of 1999 into January of 2000 had quite a bit of rain. And many of the rivers were already at or above flood stage. In fact, by the end of January, there had already been 700 deaths in Mozambique. Then on February 22nd, um, tropical cyclone Eileen hit as if, you know, they didn't need something worse. And that was just something that the country couldn't deal with. Eileen just happened to be the longest lived cyclone on record. An extremely slow moving system that traveled more than 11,000 kilometers. It turned an already catastrophic flood into Mozambique's worst natural disaster in a century. The channels of the rivers were already full, the soil was already moist, um, the emergency services had already been stretched. On top of that, this is a, a very, what we call a hydrologically sensitive area. Any additional rain isn't going into the ground. Parts of the country that had never been flooded were now underwater. By the beginning of March, a million people were homeless. <laughs> 
Mozambique, with only one functioning helicopter, used by the president, was severely underprepared. There are thousands of people out there who really need to be rescued, and the helicopters you see behind here are totally overwhelmed. Six South African Defence Force helicopters saved thousands of stranded people. The situation is really bad. It's perhaps the worst thing I've uh, seen in my entire life. As neighboring countries mobilized their forces to deliver more helicopters, boats, aid and finances, Mozambique's own history of conflict came back to haunt its citizens. Once the most landmine riddled country in the world, the government had made exhaustive efforts to clear the explosives. That now we're going to have a problem. Where they are the mines that have been washed out, nobody knows. Plastic covered mines were carried away in the floods, creating new minefields where none had previously existed. As you see, this is a PMN that is with explosives and with the metal contamination, you know. Tracker dogs and survey teams were sent on a dangerous mission to locate the mines. As problems mounted, a health emergency deepened. You have inundation of farms, animals dying, livestock essentially becoming a part of that same water that again breeds diseases. You typically have gastroenteritis, you have waterborne diseases. You even have cases of malaria. Water becomes a breeding ground for mosquitoes and malaria. The problem when you have large amounts of displaced people, they tend to be crowded into certain areas where maybe they're not getting the proper nutrition, and then that just can make the, the whole situation of spreading disease and illness uh, uh, greater. So it's just like one problem after another that keeps on happening, keeps on accumulating. Because of this, you have a complete collapse of the health situation. By mid-August, Pakistan was also beginning to face a healthcare emergency. As the rains continued, a fifth of Pakistan was now underwater, an area roughly the size of Switzerland, Belgium and Austria combined. So in Pakistan, being a densely populated country and a fifth of their land is submerged during this flood, the fact that 20 million people were displaced is not a surprise. That's not something the country's going to recover from very quickly. Of the millions affected, many were in desperate need of food, medical care, and most of all, clean water. Many became incredibly angry at what they perceived to be a lack of response by the government. Many of the bridges were broken, a lot of the dams were flooded. A lot of the lowland regions where people live uh, were completely flooded. So getting the aid to those, those populations required air support as opposed to uh, ground level support, which brings a lot of challenges. Although 30,000 troops were sent in, aid was patchy and inadequate. Soon, the first cases of cholera began to appear. Cholera is often a fatal disease caused by eating or drinking bacterially contaminated water. Crowding exacerbates the problem as the bacteria is spread. But even more than that, when you have a flood sweep through, especially in an urban area, you have things like sewer lines that break and other toxic material that gets into the water. And so water becomes unsafe and diseases can spread that way too. So you have both the insect-borne diseases and the stuff associated with sanitation being disrupted. Okay. 
In a survey of flood survivors, it was found that the vast majority of the villages were getting their drinking water mainly from flood and rainwaters, or rivers and springs. So the key word here is vulnerability. So you could have a very major weather event, like a flood or a tornado, that either impacts a low population area where no one lives, or impacts a population that's very accustomed to these and prepared for it, and so its impacts will be small. Then you could have a severe or even a moderate weather event, like a flood, that impacts a population that has substandard housing that can collapse very quickly that have no resources to fall back on if their farms are destroyed, or that are elderly or disabled and can't evacuate very quickly. Pakistan is, of course, an example of a country that has some vulnerable populations, and with the heavy rain they got, it was truly catastrophic. At the end of the 2010 floods, the official Pakistan death toll stood at close to 2,000 people. A figure dramatically lower than the millions left facing a devastating future. After the, the rains ended, there was still a humanitarian disaster where there were diseases and there were you know, food issues and all kinds of problems that, that came with this massive flooding event. In terms of the size of the population affected, it was six times greater than the 2010 quake in Haiti. And nine times greater than the Boxing Day tsunami of 2004. Floods destroyed many cotton crops. Electricity shortages paralyzed the textile industry. Food prices surged. Families lost their loved ones, livestock, homes, lands, dowries, and goods. For some people, life would never be the same again. The devastation caused by extreme flooding shows how fragile we all are. The predicted increase in the frequency and severity of severe weather events, coupled with an exploding population, may test the world's capacity to cope. In the face of both in combination, is there anything that can be done to better prepare ourselves? The first thing is to stop burning fossil fuels in particular and transition to a very low carbon economy. The other option is go back to engineering. Now, engineering options are expensive. They cause a lot of disruption. But given the options that exist with us, I don't see what else can be done. The Western countries that have put most of the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere have a moral and ethical responsibility to help developing countries to develop the technology and to, to build that, that resilience. Even in disadvantaged countries like Pakistan, huge change is possible where there is political will. Since the flooding in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, its government launched the Billion Tree Tsunami Project in 2014 as a challenge to global warming. It has already overshot its target of a billion new trees by restoring and planting 350,000 hectares of forest. These trees are also helping to secure river embankments, as well as heavily degraded slopes. It is the largest ever eco-project in the country, and such a source of national pride that many other provinces are considering the same. Before 2014, it was just an idea. So I think there will be major changes uh, in the future. The question is how quickly we're going to get there.